Hello, my name is Thomas and welcome to the latest episode of British Culture, Albion Never Dies. This episode is Q is for Queen and could it stand possibly for anything else? Well, no, I received about 67 answers in total, plus friends and family. 49 answers from the Facebook group and about 18 from Instagram and most of them really were Q is for Queen. A couple of other answers that generated a bit of support, but uh, it's unusual to have so many answers, all of which pertaining to one topic. So Q is for Queen, undoubtedly in the alphabet of Britishness. Who said this? On Facebook, Paul, David, Ing, saying Queen, God bless her, Jody, Jill, Pam, Scylla, Sue, Kenny, Tim, David. On Instagram, Aussie Bond Guy, Daniel Gaster, ST Lee 88, and Bond on a Budget saying both Elizabeths and Victoria. Most people just put Q as for Queen. A few people uh, did specify uh, which one. Uh, but what can I say? I mean, the Queen, of course, is our longest reigning monarch in our history. She's, of course, Queen of England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And I suspect coming up uh, for the Jubilee coming up, there'll be a huge amount of information and biographies, possibly even from this podcast channel. But since most people were non-specific, they just put Q as for Queen... I thought maybe for this episode, I'd have a look at some of the lesser known queens. Why not start possibly with the earliest queen we really have good records of, which is Queen Bodicea. So I thought I'd start off with Queen Bodicea, move through some of the, the little known queens. I will touch on, of course, the big famous ones that we all know. But as I say, I thought maybe I could, maybe I could add something here. There's a bit little, little known outside the UK especially. Um, so who is Bodicea? Just a quick overview. Had a look on the Encyclopedia Britannica, always a good source. Bodicea's husband, Prasutagus, was king of the Iceni in what's now Norfolk, was a client under Roman suzerainty. When Prasutagus died in uh, 60, the year 60, with no male heir, he left his private wealth to his two daughters and the Emperor Nero, trusting thereby to win imperial protection for his family. Instead, the Romans annexed his kingdom, humiliated his family, and plundered the chief tribesmen. While the provincial governor, Suetonius Paulinus, was absent, Bodicea raised a rebellion throughout East Anglia. The insurgents burned Camulodonium, which is Colchester, very Lamian, St. Albans, the Mart of Londinium, London, and several military posts. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, Bodicea's rebels massacred 70,000 Romans and pro-Roman Britons and cut to pieces the Roman Ninth Legion. Paulinus met the Britons at a point thought to be near present-day Fenny Stratford on Watling Street and regained the province in a desperate battle. Upon her loss, Bodicea either took poison or died of shock or illness. So, Queen Bodicea, who allegedly said the words, Britons shall never be slaves, she is the, the leader of the Great Rebellion against the Romans, pretty early on in the Roman conquest of Britain. As the Encyclopedia Britannica said, much of what we know about her comes from the Roman historian Tacitus. And what I find really interesting is that if the victors write the history, uh, and the Romans, of course, were the victors and did write the history, nonetheless, it's not a vindication of the Romans. Tacitus is, I'd say, surprisingly scathing for an ancient historian on the Roman side and gives a great deal of praise to the, to the courage and leadership of Queen Bodicea. It's something I've often read about, so I thought... Why not just go straight to the source? Why not go straight to Tacitus? It is, of course, um, <laughs> out of copyright. You know, he's, he wrote 2,000 years ago. Um, almost. The translations, of course, you know, are very much owned by the person who translated them. But I found online on uh, penelope.uchicago.edu, uh, I found uh, a reproduction of a, a translation of Tacitus from 1937. The text is in the public domain, uh, freely printed by them. So unusually, I'm going to read out a good long section from the Annals of Tacitus, uh, Book 14, paragraphs 31 to 39. This is the bit that pertains very much to to Bodicea, who is a legendary queen. She's been portrayed you know, in, in statues, in a poem, by Tennyson, in dramas, in films. She's quite a legendary figure. But here we have, I'd say, the most authoritative source on Bodicea. And let's have a look through it, just word for word. Here we go. 
The Icenian king, Prasutagus, celebrated for his long prosperity, had named the emperor his heir together with his two daughters, an act of deference which he thought would place his kingdom and household beyond the risk of injury. The result was contrary. So much so that his kingdom was pillaged by centurions, his household by slaves, as though they had been prizes of war. As a beginning, his wife Bodicea was subject to the lash, and his daughters violated. All the chief men of the Icenians were stripped of their family estates, and the relatives of the king were treated as slaves. Impelled by this outrage, and a dread of worse to come, for they had now been reduced to the status of a province, they flew to arms, and incited to rebellion by the Trinobantes, and others who, not yet broken by servitude, had entered into a secret and treasonable compact to resume their independence. The bitterest animosity was felt against the veterans who, fresh from the settlement in the colony of Camulodunum, were acting as though they had received a free gift of the entire country, driving the natives from their homes, ejecting them from their lands, which they styled them captives and slaves, and abetted in their fury by the troops, with their similar mode of life and their hopes of equal indulgence. More than this, the temple raised the deified Claudius, continually met the view, like the citadel of an eternal tyranny, while the priests chosen for its service were bound under the pretext of religion to pour out their fortunes like water. Nor do there seem to be any great difficulty in the demolition of a colony unprotected by fortifications, a point too little regarded by our commanders, whose thought had run more on the agreeable than on the useful. Meanwhile, for no apparent reason, the statue of victory at Camulodonium fell, with its back turned as if in retreat from the enemy. Women, converted into maniacs by excitement, cried that destruction was at hand, and that alien cries had been heard in the invaders' senate house. The theatre had rung with shrieks, and in the estuary of the Thames had been seen a vision of the ruined colony. Again, it appeared that the ocean had been blood-red, and the ebbing tide had left behind it what looked to be human corpses, were indications read by the Britons with hope and by the veterans with corresponding alarm. However, as Suetonius was far away, they applied for help to the procurator Catus de Cianus. He had sent not more than 200 men without their proper weapons. In addition, there was a small body of troops in the town. Relying on the protection of the temple, and hampered also by covert adherents of rebellion who interfered with their plans, they neither secured their position by foss or rampart, nor took steps by removing the women and the aged to leave only able-bodied men in place. They were as carelessly guarded as if the world was at peace, when they were enveloped by a great barbarian host. All else was pillaged or fired in the first onrush. Only the temple, in which the troops had massed themselves, stood a two-day siege, and was then carried by storm. Turning to meet Petilius Cerialis, the commander of the Ninth Legion, who was arriving to the rescue, the victorious Britons routed the legion and slaughtered the infantry to a man. Cerialis, with the cavalry, escaped to the camp and found shelter behind the fortifications. Unnerved by the disaster and the hatred of the province, which his rapacity had goaded into war, the procurator Catus crossed to Gaul. Suetonius, on the other hand, with remarkable firmness, marched straight through the midst of the enemy upon London, which, though not distinguished by the title of colony, was nonetheless a busy centre, chiefly through its crowd of merchants and stores. Once there, he felt some doubt whether to choose it as a base of operations, but on considering the fewness of his troops, an efficiently severe lesson which had been read to the rashness of Petalus, he is determined to save the country as a whole at the cost of one town. The laments and tears of the inhabitants as they implored his protection found him inflexible. He gave the signal for departure, and embodied in the column those capable of accompanying the march. All who had been detained by the disabilities of sex, the lassitude of age, or by local attachment, fell into the hands of the enemy. A similar catastrophe was reserved for the municipality of Verulanium, as natives, with their delight in plunder and their distaste for exertion, left the forts and garrison posts on the one side, and made for the point which offered the richest material for the pillager 
It was unsafe for a defending force. It is established that close upon 70,000 Roman citizens and allies fell in the places mentioned. For the enemy neither took captive nor sold into slavery. There was none of the other commerce of war. He was hasty with slaughter and the gibbet with arson and the cross, as though his day of reckoning must come, but only after he had snatched his revenge in the interval. Suetanius had already the 14th legion, with a detachment of the 12th and auxiliaries from the nearest stations, altogether some 10,000 armed men, when he prepared to abandon delay and contest a pitched battle. He chose a position approached by a narrow defile and secured in the rear by a wood, first satisfying himself that there was no trace of an enemy except in his front, and that the plain there was devoid of cover and allowed no suspicion of an ambush. The legions were posted in serried ranks, the light-armoured troops on either side with the cavalry massed on the extreme wings. The British forces, on the other hand, deposed in bands of foot and horse, were moving jubilantly in every direction. They were in unprecedented numbers, with confidence running so high that they brought even their wives to witness the victory and installed them in wagons which had stationed just over the extreme fringe of the plain. Bodicea, mounted in a chariot with her daughters before her, rode up to clan after clan and delivered her protest. It was customary, she knew, with Britons to fight under female captaincy, but now she was avenging not as a queen of glorious ancestry, her ravaged realm and power, but as a woman of the people, her liberty lost, her body tortured by the lash, the tarnished honour of her daughters. Roman cupidity had progressed so far that not their very persons, nor age itself, nor maidenhood were left unpolluted. Yet heaven was on the side of their just revenge. One legion which ventured battle had perished, the rest were skulking in their camps, or looking around them for a way of escape. They would never face even the din and roar of these many thousands, far less their onslaught and their swords. If they considered in their own hearts the forces under arms and the motives of the war, on that field they must conquer or fall. Such was the settled purpose of a woman, the men might live and be slaves. Even Suetonius, in this critical moment, broke silence. In spite of his reliance on the courage of the men, he still blended exhaustions and entreaty. They must treat with contempt the noise and empty menace to the barbarians in the ranks opposite. More women than soldiers meet the eye, unwarlike and unarmed. They would break immediately when, taught by so many defeats, they recognised once more the steel and valour of their conquerors. Even in a number of legions, it was but a few men who decided the fate of battles, and it would be an additional glory that they, a handful of troops, were gathering the laurels of an entire army. Only keeping their order close, and when their javelins were discharged, employing shield boss and sword, let them steadily pile up the dead and forget the thought of plunder. Once the victory was gained, all would be their own. Such was the ardour following the general's words. Such alacrity had his veteran troops, with a long experience of battle, prepared themselves in a moment to hurl the pillum. That Suetonius, without doubt of the issue, gave signal to engage. At first, the legionaries stood motionless, keeping to the defile as a natural protection. Then, when the closer advance of the enemy had enabled them to exhaust their missiles with certitude of aim, they dashed forward in a wedge-like formation. The auxiliaries charged in the same style, and the cavalry, with the lances extended, broke a way through any parties of resolute men whom they encountered. The remainder took to flight, although escape was difficult, as the cordon of wagons had blocked the outlets. The troops gave no quarter even to the women. The baggage animals themselves had been speared and added to the pile of bodies. The glory won in the course of the day was remarkable and equal to that of our older victories, for, by some accounts, little less than 80,000 Britons fell at the cost of some 400 Romans killed, and a not much greater number of wounded. Bodicea ended her days by poison. Was Ponius Postumus, camp prefect of the Second Legion, informed of the exploits of the men of the 14th and 20th, and conscious he had cheated his own corps of a share in the honour, and had violated the rules of the service by ignoring the orders of his commander, ran a sword through his body. The whole army was now concentrated and kept under canvas, with a view to finishing what was left of the campaign. Its strength was increased by the Caesar, who sent over from Germany 2,000 legionaries, 8 cohorts of auxiliaries, and 1,000 cavalry. 
Their advent allowed the gaps in the night legion to be filled with regular troops. The allied foot and horse were stationed in a new winter quarters, and the tribes which had shown themselves dubious or disaffected were harried with fire and sword. Nothing, however, pressed so hard as famine on an enemy who, careless about the sowing of his crops, had diverted all ages of the population to military purposes whilst marking out our supplies for his own property. Still, hatred of Rome was persistent, and the fierce-tempered clans inclined to move slowly to peace, because Julius Classinicus had been sent in succession to Catus and was not on good terms with Suetonius, was hampering the public welfare by his private animosities, and who had circulated a report that it would be well to wait for a new legate, who, lacking the bitterness of an enemy and the arrogance of a conqueror, would show consideration to those who surrendered. At the same time, he reported to Rome that no cessation of fighting need be expected until the arrival and supersession of Suetonius, the failures of whom he referred to his own perversity, his successes to the kindness of fortune. According to Polyclitus, one of the freed men who had been sent to inspect the state of Britain, Nero, cherishing high hopes that through his influence not only might a reconciliation be effected between the legate and the procurator, but the rebellious temper of the natives be brought to acquiesce in peace. Polyclitus, in fact, whose immense train had been an incubus to Italy and Gaul, did not fail, when once he had crossed the seas to render his march a terror even to Roman soldiers. To the enemy, on the other hand, he was a subject of derision. With them, the fire of freedom was not yet quenched. They still had to make acquaintance with the power of freedmen, and they wondered that a general and an army who had accounted for such a war should obey a troop of slaves. Nonetheless, everything was reported to the emperor in a more favourable light. Suetonius was retained at the head of affairs, but when later on he lost a few ships on the beach and the crews with them, he was ordered under pretense that the war was still in being to transfer his army to Petronius Turpilinus who by now had laid down his consulate. The newcomer abstained from provoking the enemy, and was not challenged himself, and conferred on this spiritless action the honourable name of peace. There we go. It's unusual for me to read out such a long piece. But, on this occasion, just to go to the original source from almost 2,000 years ago, and get an insight from the Roman perspective on an ancient British queen, I felt this was an exceptional piece, and one worth going into. Of course, if you walk along in the modern day, along the Thames, towards the Houses of Parliament, you can see the statue, Bodicea and her daughters, created by Thomas Thornycroft, who worked on it between 1856 and his death in 1885. It was erected by his son in its current place in 1902, and it's a great, imposing statue of Bodicea on her chariot, um, Again, reminding us of the long tradition of freedom in Britain. So there we go. At the very, very beginning of British history, we have a very, very powerful queen. Okay. Time to move on to the second queen, which won't be so long. But uh, is she a queen? She's sometimes known as Empress Matilda because she was the consort of the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry V. Not Henry V of England. Um... So let's have a look at this one. Empress Matilda. I've referred to her before in her battles with uh, Stephen. On the death of Henry I in 1135, his favourite nephew, Stephen of Blois, and son of his sister Adela, hurried to London where he secured election and coronation within the month. This contravened the oath he and his fellow barons had sworn in 1127 to Henry's daughter, the Empress Matilda. His election was confirmed by the Pope in 1136. I'm getting that little piece from uh, www.royal.uk forward slash Stephen and Matilda. Interesting, the official website of the royal family does refer to this time, often known as the Anarchy, um, as, you know, Stephen and Matilda. Interestingly, they, they write further about uh, Stephen. Though charming, attractive, and, when required, a brave warrior, Stephen reigned 1135-54, to 54, lacked ruthlessness and failed to inspire loyalty. He could neither control his friends nor subdue his enemies, despite the support of his brother, Henry of Blois, Bishop of Winchester, and his able wife, Matilda of Boulogne. Hmm. Henry I's daughter, Matilda, invaded England in 1139 to claim the throne, 
and the country was plunged into civil war. Although anarchy never spread over the whole country, local feuds were pursued under the cover of the civil war. The bond between the king and the nobles broke down, and senior figures, including Stephen's brother Henry, freely changed alliances as it suited them. Very, very interesting. I've referred to this before as the the anarchy, uh, and there's a great uh, series of detective novels um, and also a TV show based on it called Cadfile, which really is looking at how this civil war, you know, I was looking at the civil war, and uh, O is for Oliver Cromwell, which was very much a political war, uh, a religious war, sociological war. It was a war on so many fronts, but this was really about... If the king was not recognised as legitimate, then what authority is recognised as legitimate? And it was understood through very, very local terms. You know, should I be obeying, you know, my local lord of the manor? Should I he be obeying his his previous master? And so a lot of very, very local feuds broke out, and that's primarily how we understand it. Here's a twist in the Civil War. In 1141, Stephen was captured at Lincoln, and his defeat seemed certain. However, Matilda's arrogant behaviour antagonised even her own supporters, and Stephen was released in exchange for her captured ally and illegitimate half-brother, Earl Robert of Gloucester. After the latter's death in 1147, Matilda retired to Normandy, which her husband, Geoffrey of Anjou, had conquered in 1148. Interesting. Stephen, who was so charming by all accounts, and Matilda, who was so arrogant by all accounts, just difficult to work with in another account. Again, this is really looking at the, the royal website in another account, referred to her mistake was in demanding taxation too much and too soon. Stephen's throne was still disputed. Matilda's eldest son, Henry, who had been given Normandy by his father in 1150, and who had married the heiress, Eleanor, Duchess of Aquitaine, invaded England in 1149 and again in 1153. Stephen fought stubbornly against Henry. Stephen even attempted to ensure his own son, Eustace's succession, by having him crowned in 1152 in his own lifetime. The church refused, having quarrelled with the king some years previously. Eustace's death later, in 1153, helped lead to a negotiated peace, the Treaty of Wallingford, under which Henry would inherit the throne after Stephen's death. So he became Henry II, with Eleanor of Aquitaine as his queen. So I'm really talking in this podcast about queens who are queens in their own right. So Queen Bodicea was queen in her own right. Empress Matilda attempted to be queen in her own right. But Eleanor of Aquitaine is, of course, a queen consort. Consort, sorry, and she. I've talked about her in the past because she's such an interesting person. Eleanor of Aquitaine, born around 1122, died certainly in 1204. She was Queen of France, uh, having married uh, King Louis uh, the Seventh, and then became Queen of England from 1154 to 1189 as wife of Henry the Second, Duchess of Aquitaine in her own right, and her children, famously. Richard I, Richard the Lionheart, and Bad King John. Uh, so she was seen very much as a king maker, and perhaps the most powerful woman of the medieval era, leading armies herself to benefit, well, one or other of her relatives. Um, and beautifully portrayed in The Lion in Winter, 1968 film by Catherine Hepburn, uh, with Peter O'Toole as Henry II, her then estranged uh, English husband, with Anthony Hopkins as Richard the Lionheart, uh, Nigel Terry as John, their youngest son, and Timothy Dalton as the King of France. So again, just whilst we're talking about very, very powerful ladies, seems silly not to mention Eleanor of Aquitaine. OK, Q is for Queen of England, and among that we can include... Lady Jane Grey. She is famous for being our shortest monarch, only nine days in 1553. Beautiful and intelligent, she reluctantly allowed herself at the age of 15 to be put on the throne by unscrupulous politicians, and her subsequent execution by Mary Tudor aroused universal sympathy. Lady Jane Grey was a Protestant, in fact, an extreme Protestant, and it made her a natural candidate for the throne for those who supported the Reformation of the Church. Again, a hugely tumultuous time in British history. Her family had put her forward as the potential queen, persuading the dying King Edward to set aside his half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, in favour of any male heirs who might be born or to Lady Jane Grey. And 
Let's see, Lady Jane Grey ultimately did become queen, apparently fating when the idea was first broached to her. However, Edward's sister, Mary Tudor, the heir, according to an act of Parliament in 1544, and Henry VIII's will, had the support of the populace. As I say, only nine days she was removed by the Catholics, initially imprisoned in the Tower of London. Uh, her father was pardoned, who had been responsible for so much of the machinations for putting her there. Ultimately, her dad would lead another rebellion against Mary Tudor. It would fail, he would be executed, and she also. A very, very tumultuous time. It may be interesting that the, uh, the colour on the coat of arms for the Grey family is blue and white because the Grey is not derived from the colour Grey, uh, but from Grey sur le mer in Normandy. <laughs> and, by the way, Lady Jane Grey is related to Earl Grey. Of course, we know him now for being, uh, <laughs> being the name of Earl Grey T. Um, but the, Earl Grey T is named after Charles Grey, the second Earl Grey. He was the uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, um, and in 1833 enacted the abolishment of slavery in the British Empire. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation in America was, of course, in 1863. Anyway, Earl Grey had previously resigned as Foreign Secretary to protest the King's uncompromising rejection of Catholic emancipation, so it's interesting that Lady Jane Grey was, of course, deposed and ultimately executed as part of the attempt at uh, Catholics taking over the UK once again, whilst her long descendant, uh, Charles Grey, a member of her house, uh, was once a great defender of Catholic rights. Just on that, the abolition of slavery, it's kind of interesting, Charles Grey isn't really remembered uh, for... Uh, abolishing slavery, as I say, he's almost better known for the tea that was named after him. Um, it's William Wilberforce we tend to think of now, the politician, philanthropist, uh, native of Kingston upon Hull, Yorkshire, independent member of Parliament for Yorkshire, 1784 to 1812. He headed the parliamentary campaign against the British slave trade for 20 years until the passage of the Slave Trade Act in 1807 banning um, the slave trade, uh, which was a special commemorative coin um, in 2007. Uh, so I say it's William Wilberforce who's generally be remembered for banning the slave trade, but it was Earl Grey uh, who, who established the, uh, the abolition of slavery. If you're not familiar with the tea, there is a Lady Grey tea. It's a trademark variation on Earl Grey tea. So like Earl Grey tea, it's black tea flavoured with bergamot essential oil. But the Lady Grey tea is a, it's a modern invention in the early 1990s, um, named after Earl Grey's wife, to appeal to the Nordic market. Originally, he found Earl Grey tea too strong. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a trademark name of Twinings. Um, and Lady Grey differs in Earl Grey in that it contains more lemon peel and orange peel. Anyway, it has been sold in Britain since 1996. Okay, so those were a deep dive into the three classic queens. Of course, after that, we do have Bloody Mary, I've talked about before, Elizabeth I, William and Mary, who were co-monarchs. I think it's interesting. So we had William, who was king in his own right, Mary, queen in her own right, but both ruling at the same time, but not in anarchy, as with Stephen and Matilda. These two were cooperative co-monarchs. And of course, they were succeeded by Anne, under whom we had the Act of the Union between England and Scotland. And then, of course, yes, Victoria. And then, of course, yes, Queen Elizabeth II. I had a little look into William and Mary, which I found jolly interesting. Uh, it's under their rule that we have a great deal of constitutional change, because most of what I described uh, just now was about very, very powerful monarchs shaping the UK. And of course, nowadays we have a constitutional monarchy with Parliament enacting political policy, it was under William and Mary that we have this great uh, change. It was under them that we had the Bill of Rights, which limited the sovereign's power, reaffirmed Parliament's claim to control taxation and legislation, and guaranteed um, <laughs> that it would not have abuses of power, uh, which James II and other Stuart kings had committed. One interesting point is that James II was excluded <laughs> from becoming king again, 
and uh, and all his heirs, and this was extended to include all Roman Catholics um, since. Quote, it hath been found by experience that it was inconsistent with the safety and welfare of this Protestant kingdom to be governed by papist prince. Um, so interesting. So the sovereign was required in his or her coronation ever since to maintain the Protestant religion and not to marry a Catholic, which was very, very recently uh, had to be withdrawn from the constitutions that Charles could marry Camilla. He was, of course, born and raised a Catholic. Um, it was under William and Mary that we have the rule the sovereign is not allowed to interfere with elections, freedom of speech, proceedings in Parliament, and so on, which is the basis for modern parliamentary privilege. We have the Bill of Rights adding to the further defences of individual rights. The king was forbidden to establish his own courts or to act as judge himself. The courts were forbidden to impose excessive bail or fines and so on. However, the sovereign could still summon and dissolve Parliament, appoint and dismiss ministers, veto legislation, and declare war. So again, a great deal of constitutional change under William and Mary. We have a few little topics uh, on Facebook. Skeldra suggested Q is for quid, a slang expression for the British pound sterling, uh, or the British pound. Um, it's believed to come from the Latin phrase quid pro pro, which means something for something. So uh, 10 quid means 10 somethings. Quite a few people suggested Q is for quirky, including Yvonne, the Facebook moderator of the Facebook group um, Britain, People, Places and Pastimes, and within that, um, Amanda, Barnabas, Susan, Paula, Jill, all suggested cues for quirky, unusual, especially in an interesting or appealing way. So we can have quirky ideas, quirky sense of humour, yeah, a quirky new sitcom. Yeah, I'd say that uh, a lot of people, British people, like quirky things. Uh, Rita and Deirdre also suggested on Facebook that uh, we enjoy quaint things, so having an old-fashioned or unusual quality, the appearance that's usually attractive or appealing, like an old village is, is quaint, or quaint customs of the natives, or quaint, it can be negative, it can mean outdated, uh, but quaint is normally positive. A lot of people suggested Q is for queuing, which I like as a word because you, it's just the letter Q, with a few other vowel letters just waiting their turn. Uh, James said, definitely cues, because we tend to be the only ones who do. <laughs> Again, Margaret uh, suggested, I thought of cues too. We're famous for respecting them automatically. In some other countries, the queue is a cluster. And then Maura saying, that's true, or used to be. Not sure the queues work so well these days in France. People sometimes stand in line, and when the bus arrives, they swarm on, forgetting the line. Um, I remember being in a post office in Bradford. Uh, I was queuing up to post a letter, and the queue went all the way outside the post office, and then... Yeah, as is the Yorkshire way, if you if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, it will change. And if you do like the weather, wait five minutes, it will also change. Uh, so it was a lovely sunny day as we were all lining outside, and then suddenly it started to rain. And so we all went inside, remaining in the queue, and suddenly forming a snaky queue, without any, uh, without any interference from any authority. And I, was, I thought that was a very, very British thing, to, to spontaneously form a snaky queue. I don't know, it does seem very British to me. I quite like uh, quavers, uh, as suggested by David. Q is for quavers, which in the USA is known as an eighth note. A quaver is the musical note lasting for half a beat. So two quavers last as long as one crotchet. Again, in North America, the terminology is an eighth note. But it could also just mean quavers. The crisps, I didn't ask him to find out. Uh, so quavers are deep-fried potato-based British snack. Uh, the primary ingredient is potato starch, um, which are then deep-fried, which gives it a similar texture to prawn crackers, but a very different flavour. And they're curved and they resemble the musical note. So either way, Q is for quavers. Now pay attention, please. Right, now pay attention, 007. Now pay attention. Right, now pay attention. Pay attention, 007. Now watch very carefully. Now, pay attention, 007. Now, pay attention, 007. Right. Now, pay attention, 007. Now, pay attention. 
Okay, I said that the uh, topics had centred around two two main things. One of them was Queen. The other from Facebook, Paul. From Instagram, the style is not enough. And on Facebook, from Terry. Q is for Q from James Bond. Um, Terry said, I admit, first I thought of Mr. Q, James Bond's special technician, and then Quality Street Candies, and then the Queen. I hope I'll be forgiven. And Denise replied, off with his head. <laughs> Often, you know, people look at Q and the origin of Q and they talk about the, the gunsmith, the gun expert, the gun collector, I think, who wrote to Ian Fleming, you know, saying, hang on, this, this gun that Bond's carrying in the books, it's a lady's gun and not a nice lady at that. And so he got kind of written into the books as an expert. And some people focus on Desmond Llewellyn uh, and his portrayal of Q throughout the years as a great, great character turn. Um, I'm always surprised that most people who go into this don't go into the naval history. After all, Ian Fleming was working in naval intelligence during the Second World War, was very, very well connected, um, and surely knew all the history of Q ships. There's been a tendency now to say, oh, it's Quartermaster, um, which <laughs> I haven't really heard of Q Quartermasters ever being referred to as Q, except, funny enough, in reference to Q from James Bond. I think he's inspired it. Um, but a Q is very much Q ships. So if you're not familiar, these are the decoy vessels. They're kind of special service or mystery ships. So they are they're heavily armed merchant ships with concealed weaponry. So the idea is that uh, an enemy submarine in the First World War would be going along, they were torpedoing uh, merchant ships and then sometimes they were surfacing and using heavy guns against these civilian ships. So the Q ships looked like civilian ships but once the submarine had surfaced, flaps would fall down to reveal heavy weaponry. Um, just as Q and James Bond gives <laughs> gives our title character, you know, all kinds of objects that look like a plain mobile phone. It turns out it can elect electrocute people, or it looks like, you know, just a normal car, but it's a remote control, or it looks like whatever. So a Q ship is very much that. So they were used by the British Royal Navy and the German Kaiserliche Marine during the First World War and uh, and then they were used in the Second World War by the Kriegsmarine, the Royal Navy and of course the United States Navy. So certainly a look at this. I mean officially they didn't exist. Um, <laughs> they were, as I say, mystery ships of World War I. Uh, their captains and crew needed to be masters of disguise. So not only of themselves but their vessels. So to all intents and purposes the ships were you know, scruffy little colliers, tramp steamers, Fishing smacks and luggers manned by salty old sea dogs and no-nonsense attitude to land lovers. But behind those facades, they carry 12-pounder and Maxim guns and twice the crew that a commercial craft would normally need. So their, their mission was to decoy and destroy German submarines. They were Britain's answer to the submarine menace. Um, I found this interesting. I was looking at an article on historic-uk.com. A lovely article by Miriam Bibby, who was referring, to, this is a great little sentence, in retrospect, World War I was a steampunk war fought with every kind of contemporary weapon, so even hussar cavalry units, uh, dirigibles, aeroplanes, steam trains, horse-drawn artillery, pack mules, all kinds of uh, things and technology all mixed together. As I say, the, these mystery ships were undeniably quirky, ha, another of our cues, and were the most dreaded aspect of the new weapons technology. Uh, German High Command were far more advanced with the Admiralty in adopting the submarine, and the submarine menace was a threat to British shipping. So, so Rear Admiral Gordon Campbell wrote in his memoir, My Mystery Ships, it must not be imagined that the mystery ships were any invention of the war. The attempts to decoy the enemy are as old as can be. The hoisting of false colours is a long-standing practice, and it is only natural that enterprising officers would go a bit further and disguise the ships and think of additional ruses. I mean, very interesting, as I say, from, from a distance they look like normal ships, but even sometimes going into port, they would disguise their true intention. They would not reveal themselves as, as naval officers and, and naval ratings and so on. They would, um, they would put on disguises uh, in an attempt to fool the enemy, sometimes changing the names of the ships and changing their apparent purpose as they moved around, all trying to, I say, deceive the enemy. So once, uh, once a submarine had been spotted, once it was starting to threaten their ships, there were panic parties. So the people uh, on on the Q ship would run around and pretend as if they were evacuating, including having a stuffed parrot in a cage to add authenticity to the idea of a merchant crew abandoning ship. But 
as soon as the submarine, as it would normally surface, then to reveal its guns. They did have torpedoes, but they were few and far between. They're very expensive and not entirely reliable, so generally the submarines would pop up and then uh, open open the gates to reveal their guns, um, and it was very difficult for them to surface quickly, so they did present uh, a good target. Interesting that the disguises for the Q-ships were so, so effective that Campbell's fellow Royal Navy officers didn't recognise him but behind his bearded, scruffy persona as a, as a master or collier of a timber ship or whatever. Interesting. So as I say, it's funny, funny to my mind that we often, when we talk about Q, we leave out what is a very, very interesting bit of naval history um, and one that does clearly pertain to the Q that we all know from James Bond. Okay, I'm going to go through a few more quickly. Uh, Bree, uh, Bree Tyke, the Facebook group moderator, um, again suggested Q is for Quartermass. Uh, Professor Bernard Quartermass um, from the Quartermass Experiment of BBC Serial 1953, apparently one of the first big... Uh, one of the first big sci-fi shows on the BBC for, for adults. Um, so, of course, you have Doctor Who, which is for all the family, um, but uh, Professor Bernard Quartermass is apparently I don't know, an iconic sci-fi character um, aimed at adults. Again, more aimed at adults, I feel. Quentin Crisp, perhaps? <laughs> um, Marta on Facebook suggested cues for Quentin Crisp. Um, of course, his 1968 book, The Naked Civil Servant, uh, became even more famous when it was adapted for TV in 1975. Um, this is... The title is derived from uh, Quentin Crisp's time working as a nude model in a government-funded art school. Um, so Quentin Crisp appears initially to introduce the film, and he says the decision to find somebody else to play him was right, as they were bound to do a much better job than he does, and claims that any film, even the worst, is at least better than real life. Um, so it's his, uh, his wry take on life. Quentin Crisp, very successful writer, um, and The Naked Civil Servant is, is iconic. Sticking uh, with TV shows uh, on Facebook, Ian suggested Q is for Q. Um, <laughs> a different Q from James Bond's Q. Q was a TV show that ran from 1969 to 1982, or at least there were six seasons which kind of came and went, or six series, I should say, that came and went. Um, Q, I'd say, is most famous uh, now as being one of the Python's kind of inspiration. Uh, Q was put together by Spike Milligan, uh, who was already very, very famous and has written some fantastic books. Uh, I think it's Hitler, his part in My Glory, and uh, Rommel, Gunner Who. This is war biographies, um, <laughs> the answer to all war bores. Um, so Spike Milligan puts together these fantastic uh, anecdotes from his time, in the army. One of them is, uh, a more famous one is when he's a gunner and one of the guns is right up at the top of a ridge and there's a camp just below, kind of shielded by the ridge, but one of the guns isn't properly secured and so it rolls down the hill, goes through the camp, demolishing tent after tent after tent and taking out quite a bit of equipment before carrying on and then a bunch of gunners come running down the hill saying, has anybody seen a gun? And somebody in the camp says, what colour? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, Mike Milligan inspired the Pythons and, and is referred to in the Pythons Autobiography 2004 um, because the TV show Q came out just before Monty Python and Cleese remembers a conversation between himself and Terry Jones. Uh, he said, we both happened to watch Spike Milligan's Q and one or the other of us phoned up and said, kind of jokingly but also rather anxiously, I thought that's what we were supposed to be doing. The other one said, that's, that's what I thought too, and they'd felt that Spike Milligan had gotten to where they were trying to get got to, but if you'd asked us the previous day, we couldn't have described very well where it was, but once we saw it, we recognised it, and the, the fact that Spike had gone there enabled Monty Python to go a little bit further, and they would have done otherwise. Um, the series has been described as more miss than hit, it was very, very experimental, um, but it is interesting to, to see the odd sketch and to see you know, what influenced Monty Python. Sticking with television, but broadening out a bit. My dad. <laughs> My dad suggested quiz shows. Cues for quiz shows. Of course, there are quiz shows in every country in the world, um, but they do take a different form. They are quite, quite unique, I find, to each country. So the first BBC quiz show 
on the television was 1938 Spelling Bee, which I feel American listeners would be more familiar with. It's an adaptation of the radio format. Um, in the UK, it pitted contestants against well-known television stars in a spelling quiz, which is interesting, at least, because it shows that the uh, the celebrity edition of a game show is not all that new. It goes back to 1938. Um, but it was more... The ITV, independent television, who pioneered the quiz show in the UK, embracing the commercial angle because the BBC doesn't consider prizes to be a sensible use of public money. ITV was able to offer cash prizes, but within limits, uh, especially because this was heavily, heavily regulated in the UK. So whilst in the United States you could have the $64,000 question, uh, it had to become the 64000 sixpences in the UK, again, due to regulations. Um, th- these regulations started to be relaxed from 1994 onwards. 1998, UK TV had its first million pound prize. So because you can't focus on money as the objective, you just have to focus on it being an interesting little thing in itself, play along at home. Um, and of course, now there are apps that you genuinely can play along live. Um, so you have some shows like Eggheads, which is kind of at GCSE level, 40 to 16 year olds, you know. Um, University Challenge, if you've got university education, that's fantastic. And then Only Connect, uh, which has been described as one of those odd postdoctoral dissertations that you rapidly regret asking people about at parties. So you do have them at different levels. I think one of the interesting comparisons between the UK and the US one are two very, very similar ones in principle, which is Family Feud in the United States. I've seen this kind of travel around the world. So you get two families competing to name the most popular answers to survey questions. So are you in touch with the average man? Do you know what the majority of people think about something? The polar opposite to that would be the UK TV show Pointless, in which, again, 100 people have been asked a survey, you know, name a country beginning with A. A correct point scores, you know, a correct answer is one point for every survey subject who gave it, but the winner is the one with the least points. So if you said a country that most people didn't say, if you had some very, very obscure knowledge, you win. Um, so I find that very interesting. And of course, a pointless answer is the one that you know and none of the hundred knew. Uh, so again, in Family Feud, you say what most people say, but in, uh, in Pointless, you say what most people don't know. Um, I saw an interview uh, with one of the showrunners who was asked what's the biggest jackpot jack on Pointless, and he said it was 24750 so that's about $33,000. And what's the funniest answer you've ever heard on Pointless? And he replied, undoubtedly came in June 2013 when contestant Gemma said JR from Dallas, not JFK, was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas. <laughs> Okay, so uh, there's some quick differences, I say, between especially UK and US ones. Um, I say for UK, it can't be the money. That's the that's the main objective. It has to be just, is it jolly interesting? That's a QI is obviously a good example of that. I love the podcast, No Such Thing as a Fish, which is by the researchers of QI. And that's QI stands for quite interesting. Nobody suggested this. Um, I just like it personally because they will ask a, a question, but do you know something that's a little bit beyond that question? One thing that was asked for, Sifu Lamas asked, Q is for Queensbury rules, to which I will say, yes, yes, but also not today, because, because, I know it's been a while, but Kane, my friend Kane, who's uh, done the deep dive into tea, and the deep dive into British men's wardrobes, the deep dive into Christmas, many, many deep dives, is a martial arts expert, a real martial arts expert and practitioner. And we will be doing a deep dive into uh, British bare-knuckle boxing um, coming up. Coming up in the next few months, uh, we will be doing a deep dive into this. So I'm not going to go into it here at all. Yeah, I, d- I, did, I did consult him, and he gave me some very, very good answers for why Queensbury Rules uh, is such an iconic thing. But you know what? It sounds so good in his words, I'm not going to try and paraphrase him. I'm going to uh, interview him later and uh, and share it with all of you, because it is jolly, jolly interesting. So thank you, Sifu Lamas, who I know is a a martial arts teacher, but as I say, Kane Kane has a depth of knowledge on this and is doing so much research that we're going to have him on, I hope, real soon. Okay, on, uh, on Instagram... 
Oh, I didn't make a note of this. I think it's begin with a book. <laughs> it's, it's one of my friends uh, suggested. Q is for quite. Um, so I had a look on the, the global corpus of global web-based English from Brigham Young University, and they just look at the frequency of words and then break it down by country. So I found it interesting. I mean, Americans do use the word quite on their quick, you know, quick look on the internet. It seemed that there had been over 91,000 uses of the word quite in the United States. And Canada, 31,000. That seems, you know, so you use the word... And, you know, I guess it has the same meaning, quite, to the utmost or most absolute extent, or sometimes it means to a certain or fairly significant degree, or, you know, it could be expressing agreement. I don't want to talk about that now. Oh, quite. Um, so let's see, 91,000, 31,000, US, Canada, and the United Kingdom, 145,000 <laughs> uses. So more than the US and Canada put together for a much smaller country. So it seems that we use quite, quite a lot. Just frequency of use, and that's a really interesting thing, because sometimes you see, like, popular in the United States, people say this, and in the United Kingdom, people say that. But often, we're using the same words, but we use them with different frequency or to slightly different effect. And I find that very, very interesting. Super interesting. One person who I won't name suggested Q is for Quaker Oats. I won't name them because that's wrong. But that's really interesting, because lots of people liked it, and lots of people kind of seem to agree with Q is for Quaker Oats, and Quaker Oats seems British, but it's not. Um, it was founded by two partners, one in Canada and one in the United States. But Quakers are English. The, uh, the Society of Friends uh, is English, so-called, because uh, we bid them tremble at the word of God. Um, that's what George Fox said. So George Fox, an itinerant uh, ministry, uh, he was a preacher and uh, reached his spiritual epiphany in 1652. Um, he, was a, he was a preacher who at the end of Puritan meetings would make his statements, uh, was persecuted for it, thrown down church steps, beaten with sticks on one occasion with a brass bound Bible, refused to be intimidated, um, noted for his courage, his physical stamina, I believe the power of Christ gave him uh, the strength to lead a holy life. Um, he was uh, jailed for six months in Derby Jail, uh, offered release if he had accepted a commission in Oliver Cromwell's army, um, but refused. He believed in, in a covenant of peace, um, and it was in his, his arguments with the judge uh, that they got the name Quakers. Um, originally seen as derogatory, but now apparently no embarrassment is caused by using the term uh, today. Uh, so an interesting man who, again, people people were leaving the Civil War to join what some James Naylor called the Lamb's War. Um, and finally, finally, uh, Queen the Band. It was very, very popular. Uh, Jason Kim suggested this. Ozzy Bond guy, Sifu Lammers, Daniel Gaster, and a few people on the Facebook group. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going into it because I know nothing about it. And I'm also very wary of playing any music. Um, on this podcast unless I actually own it. Um, I know some people say, ah, oh, but it's fair use and all this kind of thing, but uh, these things change over time. I remember when YouTube uh, allowed you to play any music you wanted, uh, and then suddenly, it, suddenly the situation changed. Um, so I say, I'm very wary about putting any music on here. So I'm just skipping that. I do like, quite like this one. Q is for Quinn, an English gentleman. Uh, and this was sent in by my friend Quinn. <laughs> Q is for question time, as in Prime Minister's question time. I did cover that before. Um, but, you know, it's on every Wednesday, and I, I do I do thoroughly enjoy that. Um, thank you, Easy Smiles and Expensive Watches. Um, and Slayton, who you might know as the other guys on YouTube, uh, suggested Q is for Queen and Country. Again, I feel I've covered that happily with some of the little-known queens. Um, yeah, it will start with a book, not begin with a book. Um, he suggested quite... Oh, and maybe one more. Uh, Kane suggested quinine. Uh, Q is for quinine, the essential ingredient in gin and tonic. So it's the kind of the bitter crystalline compound, which is in the cinchona bark. Um, it's a tree in uh, South America in the tropical Andean forests. Um, supposedly has gives you some kind of benefit against malaria. Not used to prevent malaria, but it kills the organism responsible for the disease. So it's supposed to be... Uh, very good in the tropics, hence the association with the British Empire, you know, drinking gin and tonics um, out in the tropics. And those are all of my cues. Thank you very, very much to everybody who's suggested a topic. This podcast couldn't exist in this form without all your great suggestions. 
Of course, I interpret them in my own way, and I hope you enjoy that interpretation, delving this week into some of the little-known queens. But again, your your suggestions are very, very much appreciated. If you enjoyed it, uh, and you'd love to do it, please do leave a, an honest, honest five-star review on whatever listening app you're listening on, especially iTunes or Spotify. Again, I very much appreciate all of the suggestions. Thank you very, very much. The Alphabet of Britishness will return. You can contact me on Fleming Never Dies on Instagram or Albion Never Dies at gmail.com to give me yet more suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.